Welcome to a What It Takes Radio production. Greetings. Welcome to the More Power to You prayer podcast. We're glad that you could join us. My name is Stan Houston, and it's my privilege and my pleasure to work with you and to listen and learn about the Lord's Prayer from uh, Dr. David Chotka. Now, we've been hearing a lot about kingdoms lately in the news. Obviously, with the death of Elizabeth II, the Queen of the United Kingdom had passed away. And now, Charles III will be the new king of the United Kingdom. Well, we don't hear about kingdoms as much anymore, but back in Jesus' time, that was a very significant expression because that's what people were thinking about. That's what they were looking for, the kingdom. And in the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And hey, the power, the glory, the kingdom, all of those words are there. Now, what David wants to do is to help you understand just exactly what that word kingdom and what serving in the kingdom might be like. We've heard about it before, but I think we're going to find some, as always, some incredibly new and powerful insights as to what it means to say, thy kingdom come. And for those of us who are seeking to follow the Lord Jesus, how we can serve in the kingdom. So, let's listen. Dr. David Chatka. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be with you one more time. I know that we're doing this on a weekly basis, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity. And uh, Stan, it's good to see you again. It's been uh, been a little bit of time. We've uh, I've traveled and come back home, and you've traveled and come back home. You were just with the Cowboy Church, I understand, right? I'm with the Cowboy Church, and we're actually going to be doing a, a podcast from one of the Cowboy Church pastors. Uh, lessons you can learn from horses. Well, there's lots of things to learn. <laughs> lessons from horses about following Jesus. So uh, we'll have some interesting, uh, obviously, some cowboy legends and uh, some real Bible truth. So I'm excited about that. So thank you. Right. Well, well, you're welcome. It's good to be here. And we're talking about uh, the Lord's Prayer, of course. We've been doing that now for a few weeks. And uh, we're diving into the outline that we have published for for our use, and it contains six movements. So, so far, we've not covered a lot of ground yet. (laughs) We only only just finished the first line of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, you got to know something. Most people would just say those lines very quickly. And if you are listening to this podcast today and you haven't heard what I said about Father and what I said about name and hallowing the name, you do need to go back and review it. There's a lot of content in there that most people don't think about. But would you agree with that, Stan? Absolutely. As I oftentimes was taught by one of my mentors, he said, if it's good, go back and do it three times. (laughs) <laughs> well, okay, it's, it's somebody haven't heard it before. And if it's really good and you want to uh, make it a real part of your life, do it seven times. So repeat okay. is good for us, yes. Well, uh, so the background of the story is that I spent does, uh, I spent a long, long, long time diving into this. Now, on this issue, this thing called the Doctrine of the Kingdom, I, I, I did have consolation that I'd studied a little bit about this. There was some groundbreaking work done in the 1940s right through to the 1990s on this whole notion of the Doctrine of the Kingdom. And so what I'm giving to you is actually the fruit of my, of my uh, research under the tutelage of a guy named Gordon Fee, who wrote a great big thick book on the spirit. And uh, I had the privilege of studying with him, and I had one hour a week where it was one-to-one, and then I had any time I needed to do my work. And <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard about Gordon Fee. Uh, he's the guy who guaranteed the text for your NIV Bible. He wrote a great big thick book on the Holy Spirit in Paul, a skinnier one on the Holy Spirit in Paul. And he's the overseer of the New International Commentary Series of the New Testament. Now, he's retired. He's uh, getting up in years. But I must tell you, <laughs> you didn't make a mistake in his class. I'll tell you why. Because uh, I remember the first time I took a class with him. The Greek in my background had not been used for several years. He said to me that I should take a class with him in Paul. And he was teaching on First Thessalonians. So I took this course. And he asked a question of the class. 
and I gave the wrong answer. (laughs) And he looked at the class and he looked at me. It was like two weeks into this course. And he had this booming Pentecostal voice. And he said, no evidence. There's no evidence for that answer. (laughs) And what he made us do was to take the Greek text of the New Testament and to flow out the relationships, the syntactical and grammatical relationships, so that we could see where the flashpoints were in how the sentence flowed itself out for application. And uh, I did that under his tutelage for for four years. And as a result, I studied the spirit in Paul, and in particular, the spirit in Ephesians. And much of this teaching that I'm going to give you <clears throat> comes out of that process of my nose to the Greek text, particularly of Ephesians, but also the rest of Paul and in in the reference to that, the teaching of Jesus as well. So what I want to do is I want to share the screen because this this whole notion of the Lord's Prayer around the kingdom hasn't really been properly sounded out. So when, when most Christians think about this notion of kingdom, they think of the end of time. They think of the fact that Jesus is going to return, and when he returns, he brings the kingdom with him. And that, by the way, that's true. But then it makes no sense for him to command us to pray for the kingdom to come if it's already coming. It's it's a logical, it's, 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 it's a circle of reasoning. Why is he asking us to pray for the kingdom to come if the kingdom's coming? And if it's already guaranteed that the kingdom's coming, how come he said, well, when you pray, pray this way, make sure you ask for that kingdom to come, even though the package is already being delivered by, you know, by, uh, I don't know what country you're in. I'm in Canada, so Canada Post will be up here. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Postal Service is already on the way, or the expedited package has been sent off by some other company, whatever. It doesn't make any sense unless there's a deeper meaning to this whole concept of kingdom. And as I studied over years with this material, I discovered that there really is. Now, I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to look at what this uh, works out to. So can you see my screen share? Is it the screen? Yes. Okay, so there you go. So this phrase is, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And there's this marvelous phrase, your kingdom come. Of course, what I've done is I put a picture of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, we know in Jesus' teaching that the kingdom is going to be restored right there in the middle of the Middle East. That the messianic vision that was in the scripture is that Messiah would rule over the 12 tribes of Israel who would be seated there. And then the whole earth would get the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, etc. That beautiful thing. So most people think that way. And I wanted to just uh, flesh this out. So here's a different translation. This comes from the message. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. As above, so below. Do what's right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I can't pray that prayer like that every time I pray the Lord's Prayer. But when I'm pondering the Lord's Prayer, fresh insight through a paraphrase is a helpful thing. This is Eugene Peterson's, uh, I I don't know if you want to call it a translation or a paraphrase, it's somewhere in the middle. But um, when when we say, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he says, set the world right. Recast what's down here on planet earth, just like you do above, do it below. And that's a beautiful summary of the intention behind what's in that phrase kingdom. And it's not just about Jesus returning at the end of time. It's about fixing what's down here. So um, here's here's a scripture that puts it into perspective. And what I discovered when I did the research on the doctrine of the kingdom in the New Testament is that there's just about 60% of the time a contrast between heaven's presence and power and the unclean spirit's presence and power. It's summarized in this parable from uh, this teaching from Matthew chapter 12. They brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. So one of the marks of Messiah was that he would cast out demons, he would heal the sick, he would raise the dead. So all the people were astonished and they said, could this be the son of David? Is, Is he the guy? 
And so after the crowds say that, the people who had power, who were overseeing the state and didn't want to lose their power, started to criticize him and said something really kind of nasty. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow casts out demons. In other words, he has to be demonized. He has to be full of an unclean spirit. He has to be doing something ugly because that kind of power isn't given to humans. That they're, they're doing this crazy thing and they're attributing an evil motive and an evil power behind Jesus' power over the demons. So here's what Jesus says when they're saying that and thinking that. Jesus knew their thoughts and said this to them. And look at the language and then and, and look at the phrases that are attached to this doctrine of kingdom. And of course, this is the quote that Abraham Lincoln used after the American Civil War. A kingdom divided itself against itself cannot stand. It comes right out of the teaching of Jesus. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided itself against itself will not stand. And after he says that, he goes right for the jugular and talks about satanic kingdom versus God kingdom. And the language of the, of the narrative that everybody in the audience understood was that when he referred to God's kingdom, he was referring to opposition to Satan's kingdom. Here's the language. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, i.e. Prince of Demons, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they'll be your judges. So he sets, he takes on this view that you can get unclean spirit power from an unclean spirit being to cast out unclean spirits and immediately talks about kingdom versus kingdom, power versus power, spirit versus spirit. Now look at the language. This is what Jesus said as the summary, there's one more verse after this, but this is the summary that I want to drive the application point to. If it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, I want people to process this. Think about it slowly and let your heart marinate, your mind marinate as this teaching works itself into your pores. The whole point of Jesus' coming was not merely to get us saved. It was to defeat the power of the evil one and to take what was called the kingdom of powers of darkness and to transfer people from that kingdom into the kingdom of God's light and glorious healing and grace. So he says this amazing thing. Now, have you noticed the language here? It talks about spirit to drive out demons being the way that the kingdom of God comes. Have you got that? <laughs> so when I've prayed that Lord's Prayer all through my childhood and right into my adulthood and for most of the years of my early ministry, I did not think that way when I prayed the Lord's Prayer. What I thought was, oh, this refers to Jesus' rule at the end of time when all the evil is vanquished and he comes back and everything's going to be set right. And that's there's great truth there. But existentially, and in terms of real time, Jesus is saying the kingdom comes when evil is pushed away. That's remarkable. Now, let's go into the, another passage where you have another clear case where Jesus makes this teaching absolutely crystal clear. So he arrives, he spends six months to a year teaching and so on. He gets about 70 people following him. He goes off and he spends a night in prayer. He gets the 12 uh, apostles selected for him as he's in conversation with God through the night. And then he commissions to go out and to teach and preach two by two. Now notice the language and notice once again, there's a two-spirit contrast as Jesus talks about the kingdom. He called his 12 disciples to them. He gave them authority to do what? What does it say? Drive out, uh, to, uh, drive out evil spirits, heal every disease and sickness. As, most, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Now, stop right there and look at what he got. He commanded them to do. And then he says, oh, by the way, the content of what you just did is actually this. Stop it. Look at it. Marinate in this. Process this. Let your brain become saturated with this. He is defining what the kingdom is in the present time. 
I'm going to say it again. He gives them authority to cast out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And then he says, oh, by the way, this is what the message is. The kingdom of heaven is near. And if you don't get it with the first part, he gives you the content in the second. After he says, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near, he defines it. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you've received, freely give. Now, I've sung that old chorus, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. We always use it to refer to forgiveness of sins. We use it to refer to justification by grace through faith. We use it to refer to getting saved. Jesus used it to refer to the proclamation of the kingdom, which is characterized by healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, driving out demons. It's a remarkable difference between that culture and their understanding of kingdom and 21st century America, Canada, Western world, even in, in other parts of the earth. Now, I will tell you, I have preached in Asia. I have preached in Latin America. I have preached in um, Africa. The Africans, most Asians, and most Latin Americans understand this. Uh, most Western Christians who are schooled in scientific worldviews and theories of cause and effect and empirical thought and so on, try to, how do I say this? Try to not refer to supernatural encounter when we talk about kingdom. And they're the ones who push this off to end of time. At any rate, what does it mean? So, I mean, I, <laughs> if you're going to pray the prayer, you should have a good idea of what you're praying. That's, you know, that's, that's a very helpful thing. And so here's what it means. Um, it's, it's actually a two-spirit contrast. Now, I did say this in an earlier um, uh, podcast, but I want to underscore it again so that we don't miss this. Um, it's beloved. Now we are children of God. It does not yet appear we shall be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Now, there's two phrases in here that characterize the whole doctrine that hangs around how the New Testament is put together. It's called the now, not yet, or the already, not yet, if you want to use the terms of the people who first coined this. Uh, the first guy to say this beautifully was a guy named Oscar Kuhlman uh, at the close of World War II, a German guy who sided with the Allies. At any rate, he was um, he summarized this and he used an illustration. And here's what he said. We're already not yet. On this one phrase hangs the entire New Testament understanding of the kingdom of God and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so here we have a picture of World War II, uh, uh, the D-Day invasion. The Allies came and they had to take the beach at Normandy. And when they took the beach at Normandy, they established what they, what they called a beachhead or a foothold, if you want to use that language. And as soon as the Allies had that little piece of ground, they knew that they were going to be able to defeat the people who had conquered all of those free nations and put them under the Nazis, the Axis powers, right? And so there was an awful lot of bloodshed spilled on that beach in Normandy. Americans, Canadians, Brits, anybody who was expats from the countries that had been conquered, all of them poured their resources into taking that tiny little piece of, of ground so that all of the rest of Europe could have a funnel through which the, the resources and the power and the, uh, and the weapons and uh, the soldiers, etc., from the Allied forces come back and help France regain its freedom, could help, um, could help the English from being you know, attacked by, by the Nazis, could help all the countries that have been conquered, like the Netherlands and Belgium and so on and so forth. They had to get the beachhead in order to win the war. Everybody on D-Day knew that the war was over except the Axis powers under Hitler's command. In stupidity and madness, they continued to fight on and the bloodiest battles of World War II were not fought before this. They were fought between D-Day, which was decisive day, when the troops landed on the shores in Normandy, and VE Day, when the victory came on the final thing, when Hitler uh, uh, took his life and, and the, the heads of the, of the, the, the Axis powers uh, were defeated completely. So here's the point. We're living between two eras. We have uh, a beachhead. It's called the Cross of Jesus. And when the Cross of Jesus was established on earth, he swallowed up all of the enemy's power and he created a beachhead through which the powers of the next age could flow into this one 
It was the end of the domain of the devil and the beginning of the glorious liberation found in Christ the Lord. Just like the, not, the Nazis were defeated, but they were not yet, they still fought on. There was this already not yet thing kind of happening, and that's what happened in World War II, and it's what happens with us. Now, the first guy to say this was actually a German scholar named Oscar Coleman. <laughs> and so he summarized it beautifully. And from that point forward, this phrase already not yet became central to New Testament studies, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So here we have an understanding of what's going on. To pray the Lord's Prayer and to say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is actually a spiritual warfare prayer. Through that phrase, we declare our allegiance to heaven's power as God moves by his spirit through us to toss out Satan and disarm his power. That's the thrust of what happens with this. You have an unclean spirit who's got a kingdom and he's attacking everything that's lovely, true, and pure. You have a Holy Spirit and a kingdom is attached to the goodness of God and the grace of God. These two kingdoms are at war, and both of them will not be satisfied until one or the other is vanquished. And of course, God is the much bigger power. He uses us as soldiers in the battle. Now, I here's a here's a little kind of kind of a fun moment to bring this into perspective. Now, years ago, I you know I this is my favorite Christmas carol, by the way. And the reason it was my favorite Christmas carol when I was a kid was I liked the melody. <laughs> it was a it was a minor tune, you know, and uh, I would sing this with great gusto, even though I had not a clue about what it was I was reading or singing. You know, and it goes, God rest you, married gentlemen, with not, not, nothing you beat you dismay. No, by the way, nobody knows who wrote the thing. It's a 500 year old uh, uh, hymn back from the days of England. Charles Dickens quoted it in one of his books, and so it wound up in 19th and 20th century hymnody. But look at the language. Remember, Christ the Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now, the, the, the hymn, and I remember, you know, you, you, if you go into any Christian church in the month of December, they're singing that hymn. <laughs> is that one of your, what's your favorite hymn, uh, Stan? Is that, is that one of them? Well, and I, Joy to the World. Yep. That's one of my favorite ones. I, I remember on the radio every December 1st, I would start my program with Joy to the World. You know, we're we're gonna win. <laughs> yeah, well actually that that hymn too. Right. Joy to the world, the the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. king. Right. Yeah, it's 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 all about the return of the king. <laughs> yeah, and that uh, that that and uh also the 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 hymn that kind of says, Let there be peace on earth and let it begin in me, that I have the power and the spirit that uh, I'm kind of a, a little imitator of Jesus, you know. It's true, and what you, and of course that was a post World War II song. People, right. especially the war vets, like to sing that song. Right. I've been doing memorial services for a long time down in your country. It's uh, the end of May, and my country it's in the middle of November. But regardless, whenever there was a vet around who was a Christian, he would sing "Let There Be Peace on Earth and Let It Begin with Me," and they would sing it with great gusto. And it had to do, and they all knew this. There was an Axis power. It had to be defeated. They rose up in their day generation. They did what they had to do, and they vanquished the bad power to replace it with righteous governance. That's what they did. Well, I didn't even understand that. Now that now that song means even more to me. You know? what's, what's true is it's, it's, it's like, actually the, the very one you quoted, Joy to the World. That, that song does that thing. In fact, if you like listening to the Messiah, uh, there, there's a marvelous phrase in the middle of the Messiah where it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and of his Christ oh, yes. and he shall reign forever and ever that, that great old thing inside the mess the holy course this is gets, gets this amazing kind of thing that talks about the replacing of the domain of the devil with the rule of our Lord now again we usually press that off to the end of time yes. and that's not what was in the mind of Jesus it was an already on earth kind of thing followed by a not yet thing at the end of time. Now, how are we doing for time? Are we covered about 25 minutes now? Yeah, that's about it. Right. <laughs> All right. So, just fine. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me just summarize with this. The Lord's Prayer is a calling to partner with God in the mopping up operation begun when Jesus died on the cross and the cross was our Normandy invasion. 
That's a great picture for us. Well, yeah. I, now, I, I do think I need to go one, a couple more slides, and then we'll call this, uh, this will be our teaching for this week. Okay, so here's a recap. What did Jesus mean by the word Father? <laughs> for Jesus to pray this way for him, for him to declare himself the Messiah. Now, we had that teaching a couple of weeks ago, right? It was also to take the father-son relationship of God and Israel and to make it a lot deeper and for us to join in that. Thirdly, um, to have, pray for the name of God to be hallowed was to pray for the unity of all believers everywhere so that the world would believe and so that we could receive the love that the father has for the son. So this, this is by way of summary of what we've already studied here. Mm -hmm. It's for us to be aligned with God's agenda, including all of our living and even our dying that God might be all in all. That was our teaching last week on the glory of the name. And so in the history of Judaism at the time of Jesus, every true Jew believed that time had a beginning, a middle and an end. Messiah would come in the middle and put an end to death. His coming would divide history right smack dab in the middle of time. So actually for the longest time, we called this the year of our Lord. We talk about BC and AD, you know, before Christ and O Domini. Now they've called it before common era and after that kind of thing, because they don't want to have Jesus in the middle. I want, <laughs> I want Jesus in the middle. And so here's the point. There's two aspects to this. Messiah would come endowed with God's spirit. The people would uh, rise from the grave. You find that in Ezekiel 37. There would be a thousand year reign of peace on the Messiah and the new creation. And here you would have the contrast of the two ages. Now, if you were a good Jew living in the days of Jesus, you understood this. All of history had a beginning with the creation at the beginning and the end of time at the end. And you had this middle thing happening smack dab in the middle where Messiah would show up and he would restore the kingdom. That's the point. So the old thing, because of Adam and Eve's fall, was compromised. No, it was comprised of death and despair and pain and suffering and grief and injustice. And then when Messiah came, there would be resurrection and then hope and health and healing and reunion and justice. Everything evil and rotten and fallen and broken would end out because Messiah would bring the new thing. Now, here's what happened. Jesus came. He rose from the dead. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. That's what's the mark of the next age. The Christian believes the ages overlap that we participate in the next one while we live in this fallen and broken one. And so when Jesus came, the two marks of the next age were found in him, spirit and resurrection. See? And so what we have now is that you and I are living smack dab in the middle of this, where we know about death and we know about the Lord's intervention. We know about despair and we know about hope. We know about pain, we know about health, we know about suffering, we know about healing, and we're living between these until Jesus returns at the end of time. That's the principles that are involved in the kingdom. We continue to live in an age of death, but now it's overlapping with an age of life. I'm gonna pick up the spiritual war motif next week. We can do that in our uh, teaching next week. I just wanted people to understand that when you're praying for the kingdom to come, and the will to be done. You're not just praying about the end of time. You're praying to say everything evil, everything awful, everything horrible, everything violent, everything ugly has to go because emissaries of Jesus' kingdom, those who love him, are here to declare war on evil and to replace it with good. There you go, Stan. That's enough teaching. And, and for you. you know, in, in in the words of one of the Star Trek commanders, make it so. <laughs> yes, let's make it so. <laughs> well, thank you, Stan. It's been a delight to be with you today. I look forward to our time together next week. Well, once again, we are so grateful for this incredible learning. And thank you, Dr. Chutka. Again. I learn something brand new every time. And now when I say the Lord's Prayer, every time I do, when I come to those words that you've talked about, I uh, think a second time, maybe even a third time about just what I'm saying and how I can do that in the rest of my prayer life.
So we're very grateful for that. And we hope that you will continue along with us on this journey as we learn more about how we can have the power that will come to us as we learn to pray the Jesus way. So please uh, follow along. We'd be glad if you would uh, perhaps uh, check out the website. There are a number of resources there and uh, the books by Dr. David Chotka, spiritequip.com, spiritequip.com. Make sure you get your prayer profile, just a simple dollar contribution that will take care of it. And if you'd like in some other way to help this uh, outreach, this uh, learning lessons about how to live better and to may pray more effectively, we would be grateful for your help. Also check the footnotes. Please note uh, that uh, we uh, would like you to subscribe both to the video, if that's what you're watching, or to the podcast if you are listening. And that way you'll uh, have regular updates and you won't miss uh, any of the learning, any of the great episodes that are coming forward. So thank you very much. Until next time, all the best and blessings. And uh, let's uh, thank the Lord for all that we are beginning to learn about how we can walk with him, talk with him, and have more power in our life as we do so with him leading the way. Again, bye for now.